As countries across the globe begin rolling out their COVID-19 vaccination programs, Africa is yet to begin its mass inoculations. Now, this is partly due, we're told, to delayed agreements with manufacturers and memberships with the COVAX vaccine facility, which is the only expected uh, to begin delivering vaccines from the second quarter of this year. Now, and as the 1.3 billion people in Africa wait for their turn, so are concerns mounting of what is termed vaccine apartheid, which is looming on the continent. Uh, some richer countries have reportedly bought enough vaccine doses to inoculate their entire populations five times over, while some of the poorer countries in Africa can only expect these vaccines by as late as 2022. Now, the World Health Organization has called for global solidarity to fight the coronavirus. For more on this, let's bring in Dr. Fiona Atuhebwe, who is the new vaccines introduction officer for the WHO. Uh, she joins us from the Ugandan capital, Kampala. Doc, thanks very much for your time, especially on this important issue. Greetings for you uh, from Johannesburg and welcome to the AM report. You know, we've heard in some respects that Africa perhaps has a better chance of having these treatments in time if there's some kind of collective bargaining. It makes sense, right? If you buy more doses of the vaccine, you're likely to have them at a cheaper price. Do you know if any kind of initiative to that sort of note is, is currently in place? Thank you very much, Jan. So, yes, and that is why you mentioned the COVAX facility. So the COVAX facility is basically there for that. One, to increase uh, equitable distribution of the vaccine globally, but also to get a pooled demand to increase the pooled supply because we needed to know how many countries required the vaccine for us to, if we got the, the higher numbers pulled together the demand as opposed to bilateral agreements between a country and a particular manufacturer, if we knew the number of doses we required and gave the manufacturers the need that we have, then we can assure their market and they're able to get us the huge supply that we are requesting for at once. So we do have this uh, in the COVAX facility, pool demand, pool supply, negotiated price, global solidarity to increase equitable distribution. Yeah, the concern in the background, though, is that the COVAX facility doesn't go anywhere near enough inoculating enough of the population to deliver what is considered to be efficient herd immunity. In South Africa's case, for instance, we're only going to be able to inoculate 10% of our population through COVAX. I imagine because of equitable distribution, this is the same for countries across Africa. So South Africa should be able to inoculate up to 20% of the population. But again, as you say, this does not take us up to the herd immunity 60% that we'll be looking at to be able to prevent, uh, to, to inoculate enough people to create the, the to have enough um, immunity for the whole population. That one, you're right. On the other hand, why are we also having the 20%? The 20% is because of the global supply. Right from the start, we shall have limited supply and we are hoping that within 18 months, by mid-2022, we shall have inoculated at least 60% of the African population. That is a hope. But all the 20% that we have because of the equitable distribution we are talking about is because of the limited supply globally. And you mentioned the countries that are taking a vaccine for more than five times their population. So we are having some of these issues, but we are still hoping and ensuring that by the end of 2021, Africa will have inoculated at least 20% of their populations. So the, the urgent question then becomes, how do we ensure we're inoculating the right people in order to ensure that this 20% goes as far as it possibly can? Are you confident about the plans you're receiving from African countries about how they're planning to roll out this much needed treatment? That's a pertinent question. And this is where we shall have, we shall need to have the highest ethical standard in all countries. The World Health Organization has provided guidance to countries uh, when it comes to who should be inoculated. We've provided guidance. For example, the highest risk and uh, the most vulnerable populations to severe disease are what we have uh, advised the countries to, to give as the first recommendation. So each country has a national technical advisory group on immunization. And this group reviews evidence at country level and reviews the evidence and policies and recommendations that come from the World Health Organization. So the World Health Organization has provided guidance. One, highest risk health workers. Two, we have seen that severe disease is majorly above in among the 
elderly above the age of 65. Three, we have seen that the adults with comorbidities are also having another and equal share of, uh, of, of, of severe effects of the disease. Then we have the rest. We have teachers, we have security workers, we have many other people at the front line. So country, we gave this guidance to countries, but countries then sit down in their scientific committees and make decisions. So from what we have seen, countries have actually, most countries have given us health workers as the first priority. And this shows you that they've gone ahead to either follow the guidance or also use the evidence they have in countries because we know that the health workers we, who takes care of the caretaker. So at least for the first time, we are taking care of the caretakers because without health workers, we shall not be able to, to manage. So, so far, what I can say, what we've seen in countries, we are also going ahead in countries to advise them, given the epidemiology, we go through the statistics who has been affected the most? Who, where are we seeing the most deaths? Which region, regions are we seeing the highest uh, infections and why? And then we make this, we help the country go ahead to make recommendation on who should be vaccinated. Yeah, you know, whilst COVID-19 is, is a global health crisis, there are problems that many believe are unique to Africa. And I've already alluded to one of them. Uh, and so have you, in fact. And that has to do with, you know, wealthier nations essentially hoarding some of these, these treatments. What outside of appealing to the moral fiber of these wealthier nations can African countries actually do in response to that? So the other thing that African countries have done is actually to go ahead and do bilateral uh, deals with the manufacturers to get uh, extra vaccine outside the COVAX facility, outside the 20% that the COVAX facility is getting for them. We are also seeing the higher income countries coming out to donate this extra vaccine that they've asked for to African countries, which is something that is very good. And um, that is what we are talking about when we talk of global solidarity, because an, the effect in Africa still affects the rest of the world. You've been talking about the, the variant in South Africa and the rest of the world is now is a tenterhooks because we know that what happens in one country in a pandemic affects the rest of the world. So they've come out also in the global solidarity to show that they are willing to donate some of those extra vaccines to Africa. And Africa can also go ahead, African countries, many of them are doing bilateral agreements with the manufacturers to get extra vaccine on top of the 20%. Yeah, would you go as far as to say that perhaps it's a bit immoral for some wealthier nations to be essentially getting vaccines that they don't need. I mean, if you're going to get five times the population um, and, you know, you don't even need to do that, then it's essentially, it raises eyebrows at the very least. Uh, would the WHO go so far as to actually declare something like that as unethical behavior, given the urgent need to try to inoculate as many people in response to this pandemic? It is definitely heartbreaking. Uh, if we do not get the vaccines we've asked for as the COVAX facility, and they end up in one of the richer countries in huge numbers. So for as long as we are able, we are being able to get what we requested for, and we are signing more deals, and we are having more vaccines in our COVAX facility basket, and we are not running short of this. And again, I want to tell you that a lot is happening in the background, requesting these countries, can you please let go of these numbers? Can Requesting the manufacturers, yes, you know the populations of these countries, you know what we're looking for and what we need. And we need to end this pandemic. A pandemic is a pandemic, it's global, it's not continental, it's not a country, it's one country issue. So all these discussions are going on and for sure, we, are, we know that and we are hopeful that we shall get the vaccines we are looking for. And really, at the end of the day, our poor countries will vaccinate. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've come across any of the, the salient issues that are emerging now that there's so much talk around vaccines. And that has to do with some of the conspiracy theories around what goes into a vaccine and who is meant to receive it and what the objective of vaccinating, you know, billions of people actually entails. Are, are you aware of some of these conspiracies? And if so, is there any kind of response from the WHO to that? So in 2019, the WHO declared vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 threats to global health. Vaccine hesitancy could actually lead us into, make us fail to achieve our global health um, uh, targets to, to, to stop disease and stop transmission of disease. So yes, we are aware. And a lot has gone into this, a lot of communication trainings, a lot of communication materials. 
our best hope is communicate, communicate, communicate. Social media has not made it any easier for us. The infodemic, people find it easier to transmit the wrong information as opposed to one right scientific opinion. So we really are working hard on communication, working with you media houses. And it's quite impressive that, uh, especially for a country like South Africa, where you're having the pandemic uh, affecting the country to this level, to see that the media is coming out to try and get the right people, the right opinions into the ears and the hands of the population. So we are aware of this. We are doing the best we can together with our partners, with government, with UNICEF, with the Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. So we are working very hard to ensure that we break also this as we break the chain of transmission of, of, the, of the virus. We are also trying to break the chain of transmission of the wrong information in the hands of people. So, Really, we also appeal to you, the media, to come and work with us to help us right, give the people the right information. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll, we'll do what we can. I, I'm, I'm hoping to weigh in on, on sadly, a, a conversation that always comes up when we speak about, uh, you know, the social political issues on the continent. And that has to do with things like dysfunctional governments and corruption. It, it becomes incredibly difficult to imagine an effective way of rolling out these already stretched resources in a context where we haven't really dealt with those systemic, deeply entrenched issues uh, around our inefficiencies. I mean, is there any kind of hope that, at least for this moment, we'll be able to overlook those things, put them aside if you like, and get this out the way it needs to be rolled out? I really wish I had an answer to that. Yeah. If only the politics and the polit and and the politicians and everybody else in whose hands we lose some of these uh, of of our resources that could help our populations could change at least in this particular moment of time. We've seen in many countries what has happened to COVID related funds. But the good news is that when it comes to immunization, at least in the on the African continent, because we have a high level political will, especially with presidents who understand these things. The African Union has done an excellent job. We have an Addis Ababa declaration on immunization that was signed by all African heads of state. So they seem to understand the importance of immunization. They have prioritized immunization, a number of countries have. And we see a little bit of difference when it comes to immunization and vaccines. We've seen all the African countries join the COVAX facility, for example, for the COVID vaccine. So that to me shows that we have a high political will. What happens next when the vaccine step in the country? Because countries are expected to find resources to operationalize and vaccinate, get this vaccine into the arms of human beings. Now that's a different story, but we expect that these vaccines, what we've gone through to attain these vaccines. And by the way, we're expecting to have at least the first vaccine as early as January in Africa. January, February, we're expecting in the first quarter of 2021 to vaccinate the first Africans. So it's not far. So these countries to ensure that they put in place enough funding to support our populations. These are our citizens. Without citizens, we don't have countries. So so really, we are praying that the government yeah. will, will, will work with us. Yeah, well, from, from your lips to, to God's ears, I guess. Very quickly, Doc, I mean, if some of these uh, vaccinations are meant to take place as early as this month, if I'm hearing you correctly, do we have an idea which countries on the continent might receive the jabs first? We actually do not have an okay. idea yet. Um, yes. All right. Fair enough. But Thanks we very know much. that we shall. Sure. Yeah. All right. And we'll be watching very closely. Thanks very much for always be willing to come on to the AM report to give us an idea of what you know at the stage. Dr. Fiona Atuhebwe is with the WHO. In fact, she's the new vaccines introduction officer joining us live there from Uganda.